I think it's 25 past. I, I believe it's the last session of this conference today. So let's get started. You're all probably eager to get to the booth crawl. But first, let's talk about the SIG testing update of this year's KubeCon. My name is Patrick Uli. I work uh, on Kubernetes for Intel on various topics, including testing, end-to-end -end testing in particular. And I recently became a tech lead for that particular area in SIG testing. We do have other experts where uh, SIG testing is a fairly big SIG that owns a lot of code, but I'm the one who has done most of the work on end-to-end -end testing and therefore I got the honor to talk about that today. Usually in these SIG updates, someone goes through all the things that a SIG has done to inform the community, but I figured that with a lot of things landing very recently in end-to-end -end testing that I'll focus on just that aspect and make it hopefully interesting for you guys because that is also something that everyone who touches Kubernetes uh, sooner or later needs to deal with, whether it's developing features or debugging perhaps something or writing your own code and trying to figure out how to test that with a new Kubernetes cluster. That is where end-to-end where -end testing um, becomes useful and is needed. But SIG testing, as I said, is a, is a big SIG that is really crucial to Kubernetes. We officially own several tools that really keep the lights on in Kubernetes. These are the tools Prow for testing, Tide for merging code that has approvals. All of that are crucial tools that keep the high velocity of changes of going into, that, that are going into Kubernetes alive. And, Keeping the project healthy is part of that too. We own some tools that do analysis. Um, we also help other SIGs to develop their tests. But a mis common misconception is that SIG testing is not itself responsible for those tests. We just provide some infrastructure and then we expect and hope that the other SIGs will use those responsibly, do the right things, and, and write good tests, because good tests are part of that thing that keeps Kubernetes healthy. We run those, on all, or many tests run on all PRs, they need to pass reliably. So flaky tests are probably one of the biggest problems that we are dealing with in Kubernetes when merging changes, because the flaky test not only affects that thing that is not getting tested properly, it also affects any other PR that doesn't go in immediately because some proud job failed temporarily. Now that is a big problem that we still struggle with. And some of the hints and guidances that I'm providing as part of this talk are about some of these aspects that make tests reliable and useful and easy to debug. So that's the end-to-end the -end testing. Um, I also published a blog post, I have a link to that at the end of a talk that covers much of the same material. So if anything in the slides is too brief, you can follow up, read up on that in, in a much larger text document, share it with colleagues, post it on the wall of your cubicle if it's useful enough, I don't know, but spread the word because this, for at least for people working on Kubernetes, this is really important. So, end-to-end -end testing, the, uh, the definition first. It's, it is about testing with real components in real clusters, perhaps on VMs, perhaps on, on real hardware. Um, but it does really deploy a full, in, in many cases, it's, it's often in Kubernetes, it's a kind cluster, but it uses the same artifacts that, that get published by Kubernetes. It's not some special API server, it is the API server that is getting tested and same with all the other components, kubelet and so on. The component that does the testing is the end-to-end -end test suite. It acts like a Kubernetes client. So it's a binary, single binary, that connects to the API server and then through client go, deploys some workloads, waits for the right, right and expected reaction from the cluster to verify that the cluster works as expected. We have, and that's where it gets a little bit confusing perhaps now, two end-to-end -end frameworks under SIG testing. The one in Kubernetes that is used by Kubernetes for testing of Kubernetes is the older one. It's based on Ginkgo and Gomega, 
to tools that uh, when, are not owned by, 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 by SIG testing. These are GitHub repositories, but we've been using them for a long time. Ginkgo is the test runner that organizes the test suite and which tests run um, at which point. Um, and GoMega is an assertion library that you are using inside your tests to make statements about expected states and so on. Like Testify is another alternative to GoMega perhaps, but in, in our case we use GoMega. The, the crucial part, the crucial difference compared to the other SIG, uh, to the other end-to-end -end framework is that there is another effort, a sub-project essentially of SIG testing that at some point formed around people who wanted to do end-to-end -end testing and couldn't do it with the Intree framework because the Intree framework is kind of hard to vendor into third-party projects. That was one of the problems at the time and it still is a problem. Um, so they, they started from scratch also being a bit dissatisfied with some things that were not that well done in the entry framework for historic reasons. They, they started from scratch building something around Go unit tests as the test runner. Completely different API, completely different source code, so it's completely, completely separate. It basically forked the effort to some extent. My focus today is on the entry Kubernetes end-to-end -end framework because that's the one that I've been working with. That's the one that we have to use in Kubernetes. I don't see a path how we could somehow merge these two efforts again. It's too different. There's no viable path that replaces all of the entry end-to-end tests with something based on this other framework. So I just mentioned it here for the sake of completeness because both are called end-to-end -end framework. We probably need a better name, something for one of the, one of those should get renamed, but I don't know which one. So, well, that's where we are. Just keep that in mind. I, at this time, I'd really like to shout out a huge thanks, perhaps a clap of hands. I don't know whether he ever looks at this recording here. Onzi Fakuri is the main author of Ginkgo and Gomega, and he's been extremely helpful, all of, his, all of it in his spare time to improve Ginkgo, in particular, in particular the, the major release uh, version 2, uh, making it suitable for Kubernetes, addressing some of the long-standing concerns that we had. And we can't pay him, or at least none of, not CNCF perhaps can pay him, but we as other contributors can't do much more than really thank him. He's not here, so we can't buy him a beer, but anyway. So, this is the architecture of the entry framework as it exists today. We do have a much nicer architecture now as of just last week, basically, where at the bottom we have the E2E framework. It lives in Kubernetes under test E2E framework. It's mostly now a standalone package that only has client Go as dependency, which is important because it used to depend on Kubernetes code elsewhere, like Kubernetes package something, which made it hard to pull that framework into a staging repo, which would have been the way how we could have published it earlier, except that we had all of these odd dependencies on code in Kubernetes that are not acceptable for a staging repo. Now we are technically at a phase where we have nice dependencies. So the, the bottom is the framework. It manages things like creating a test namespace, connecting to the API server, cleaning up, um, handling timeouts, things like that are in that framework. On top of that, we have domain-specific helpers, like create something for creating a pod, lives under test E2E framework pods, waiting for pod states is in that particular package, and we do have corresponding things for other Kubernetes constructs. Um, volumes is a big one. And those helpers, they get then used by different tests. These tests live alongside the, the E2E framework. So under test E2E, we have test E2E storage as just one example. And that has the actual tests that we run um, against the cluster. And the test suites, this is the last part, the top, the part that basically pulls all of this together and defines the actual binary that we are running. For end-to-end -end testing in Kubernetes, it is test E2E, which kind of, the directory structure is a bit confusing. It, it's, 
probably shouldn't be like that, but that's, that's the historic part. We can't easily move things around, but at least the dependencies are more, more, more sane now. So test E2E is the main entry point for building the test E2E binary. Some of you might know conformance testing. That's the same binary that gets published as part of a Kubernetes release, and Sonoboy then runs that binary to do conformance testing. It's basically a subset of the tests that we use for full testing in Kubernetes. We have two other test suites. E2E node, uh, owned by SIG node, is used to test kubelet. And it's running a bit differently. It's, in this case, um, it's running alongside kubelet, not with a real cluster, basically on the node or on a, on, a, on a fake node. But it does have the API server so that it can do things like create a pod, see that the kubelet actually executes that pod, and that's why it's also using the same framework. And kubeadm is also a, an end-to-end -end test suite using that framework. So these are the, the entry things. I personally have had an interest in this E2E framework because I also wanted to do testing of a CSI driver. So at some point, I have vended Kubernetes Kubernetes to get access to that framework. And it has, it, it has worked. It, it's, it's just a bit more tricky to, to get the dependencies right. So there are out of tree test suites that I know of that I've personally written myself that use that same framework. It's possible. So the re one, some of the recent efforts um, have been the Ginkgo v2 migration. I already mentioned that major version update. It gave us a lot of new features. But then we also had some discussions around what actually are best practices? What do we recommend to people? And I need to call out one thing here. We looked at failure messages. Some of them were just very brief, and that has been a problem. Um, and we had a discussion, and we basically said, well, yes, it is OK for the failure message, because that's the first thing that we show to people if they look at the failed brow job for a failed test. That's the full message that they see first. And we said that, yes, it is OK to make that a long detailed, informative message, including multiple lines of debug dumps that say, for example, describe a port that hasn't reached a certain state. And that's OK if that output contains content that varies between test runs, because we have tools that correlate message uh, different test failures from different uh, runs. But they can handle differences like different hex values inside that output. And they still correlate that. So it's, it's OK to make that message long. And it's useful, so let's do it. Which leads me to the next point. How do we generate those failure messages? Ultimately, a test should pass. It should never fail. But if it fails, these failure messages make the difference between a good test and a bad test. A bad test will give you no useful information. You will have to start downloading the binary, downloading the test suite, modify the test suite, add debug output, and all of that doesn't work if a failure occurs only occasionally in your CI. Then you're basically stuck with what you have in your test code and, and what, what it prints. So in the context of Kubernetes, we made another decision. We deprecated some of the helper functions that were in the framework. Because at some point, some people started adding things like framework, expect no error, framework, expect equal. It basically created another Kubernetes-specific domain language for writing test code. We, we concluded that this is not what we want to focus on. Using Omega directly is what we recommend now. We have much more flexibility in the upstream Gomega compared to what we had. What we had in, in the framework was basically just a small subset. Let's just use Gomega directly. It was one of the, tech, the design decisions that we made. There's one exception. Our version of expect no error has some special handling of um, API server errors. So that's actually recommended for that particular one use case. But it's, that's the only one. Another thing that people often get wrong is that they use Gomega, but then they only know about, say, strings contains. So what they do here is they pass the result of some check in Go to Gomega expect. And the failure message then is expected true to be false if it fails. That's not helpful. 
it's much better to let Gomega see the actual string and then use a Gomega assertion like Gomega contain substring with the expected substring. And even better is if you add some additional information about what it is that you are checking. Because then, when it fails, it will tell you, I was checking log output. Here's what I got. Here's what I expected. And all of that will be in your failure message. So when it fails, you will have almost all of the information that you need to get started debugging the failure. But there are probably cases where there is no suitable Gomega assertion. You could write one. That's part of the design of Gomega, that you can write custom measures, and that may be the right choice, but it's also a bit complicated. If, if for one-time things, you may do something like, I'm, I'm, import, I'm, I'm checking something in Go, but then it's your responsibility to have a Ginkgo fail F message that is informative to really print something that's useful. Another problem that we've had is that formatting API objects like a pod structure has not been done or has not been useful with full introspection of all fields. That was what, what, what Gomega normal, normally does. So Gomega failure messages, they use this helper package here, Gomega format, to dump a pod. And it, it usually truncated because we do have fields like a timestamp, which when you look at every single field has lots of things inside that you don't care about, like a time zone. So we ended up with a pod that had lots of information about the time zone of one field and then it got truncated. Not, not very useful. What we changed is that this Gomega format in our end-to-end -end test for suite gets modified or get, there's a hook that says basically as a, as a, it, it intercepts for formatting. If it sees something that looks better in JAML, it will format that object as JAML. So you will get a JAML dump of your pod, which omits unset fields like you would get from kubectl, and you get fairly readable output when using that infrastructure. The other thing is, Recovering from failures, so a test suite might a test might time out. It might get interrupted if you if you board it manually. Ginkgo v2 added something called defer cleanup. It's like defer in a function, but with some some additional features. It uh, I have that on the next slide. It will it will print it will deal with contexts and timeouts. So the def, the cleanup action the time the test and the cleanup code get different timeouts, all handled by Ginkgo. And the other benefit is you can call this defer cleanup in a helper function. You can't do the defer in a helper function because you always exit from the helper function and then run the real tests, but defer cleanup registers the callback so that it runs at the end of your test. That's the other big advantage. Um, we have additional tooling in Kubernetes, um, this framework ignore not found here. So this example here basically creates a pod. It will do some testing with a pod and we want to be sure that it gets deleted. This is part of the recommendation. Uh, a pod is a namespace resource, but cleaning it up can often take a long time. So it's useful to do that explicitly to see where your delays are or to be notified if deleting the pod fails, then if you do it in a defer cleanup, it will be a test failure. If you rely on the automatically deleting of a namespace, the namespace might never get deleted and you don't see that because it's asynchronous, it's not, the test doesn't wait for the namespace to be deleted. It just gets triggered, but it doesn't wait for it. So it's better to do that explicitly. But then what happens if you register this cleanup call and then your normal test deletes the pod, it would the, the Ginkgo defer cleanup automatically does error checking. It would get an error from pod client delete saying not found and it would test fail the test. So we have this ignore not found that you can use in situations where it's okay to not, uh, to, to treat that as not an error. I've mentioned interrupting. Another tip that I have is a Ginkgo v2 feature called poll brokers after some small delay. Usually it's much higher. I'm not sure what even the default is, but if you run it interactively, what this does here is it will 
regularly, if a test runs for a long time, after 30 seconds, it will start giving you information where the test is currently stuck. The, before, the approach that we had before was that anything that pulls needs to dump some log message fairly frequently. And it was doing that also in the CI runs. So we ended up with long logs of, say, checking port, checking port, still checking port, still not done. And with this, we can control how often we get that output. And it's fairly detailed. It will tell you exactly which Ginkgo test, the latest Ginkgo buy, if you instrument your tests with that, so you know where you are. You can also debug with Delph if you want to do it interactively. That's the invocation. That's all Kubernetes specific. So it assumes that you are on the root of Kubernetes. Um, this here, this make command ensures that you build the right Ginkgo. There is some version dependencies between the Ginkgo CLI and the test suite. So it's better to use the one that gets built together with, with Kubernetes. And, and finally, it's now safe to interrupt at any time with Control C because we do have much better cleanup handling now in Kubernetes than we had before. I've been guilty of interrupting a test suite and rebuilding the entire cluster because I wanted to be sure that it's in the same state. That should be less, less often necessary than it used to be. How it works under the hood, and again, a Ginkgo v2 feature, is like a normal Go code. The, the callback that I registered with Ginkgo get, can, can optionally take a context parameter. It's fine to leave it out, but then you don't get information. Your, your code that runs doesn't know how much time it has left. So in Kubernetes, we almost always want the context pass that down into API calls with client Go. And when that function times out or the test suite gets aborted, that context gets canceled and everything immediately returns and cleanup can start. Otherwise, this Go routine would keep running. It wouldn't know that it needs to stop. There's no feature in Go to kill a Go routine. It has to know that it has to stop. This is also a bit tricky because the cleanup, for example, needs a new context. It can't use the same one from the, the surrounding it function because this context here will be cancelled at the time when the callback gets invoked. And this is, this is tricky. It's a slippery slope here getting this all right. This is where our uh, documentation has lots of guidance, different steps that can go wrong and did go wrong. These are all things that I found in practice when rewriting much of the EDUE testing to use these contexts. So I'm not going to, go to cover more details, but this is material that you probably want to, will want to look at if you want to get this right. And I wish we had better linters for this, and I have some ideas, but no implementation yet. Other things, other guidance is uh, around timeouts. So lots of tests have made up their own timeouts, how long they expect things to take. This is problematic because performance of a cluster can vary. We are kind of using timeouts that fit what we currently use in our Kubernetes CI, which is unfortunate because we kind of have to make assumptions about the target hardware. We, we should be more, more flexible. Perhaps at some point we will have configuration options for all of these timeouts. Right now, what we have is a recommendation to use predefined timeouts that are part of the, the context that you get for each test. Use those. Perhaps if you know have, you have a slow pod, perhaps use, use twice a pod start if, you, if, it takes, if it's expected to take longer, but try to use those, those timeouts. And then we know at least why there is a timeout where the magic value comes from. The other thing is, oftentimes testing will consist of creating something and waiting, waiting for a certain state to be reached. And this has been a source of a lot of headaches. We used to have tests in Kubernetes that are, were based on ever simple for loops with wait poll being perhaps the most common solution, but wait poll in particular was targeted towards Kubernetes production code. It wasn't meant to be used in tests. People used it anyway, and we ended up with lots of tests that just failed with one error that said, timed out waiting for the condition, full stop. And if that's the failure messages, how do you debug that? You really don't know what it was waiting for. You don't know the actual state. So um, it also, wait poll was often used without a context. It wouldn't stop immediately. 
It would continue pair polling although the test already failed or timed out. So we, we came up with a long laundry list of things that a good polling implementation should support. Wait, accepting a context for waiting. Be informative. When interactively used, it should tell you why it's waiting, what current state is while it's waiting, ideally using the same format as the failure message. Um, but not in VCI, because in VCI we don't care about the intermediate state, we just care about the results. So it needs to be configurable. Then when it fails, it's often because it observed some state, but then perhaps there have, other, have been other errors. We want both the, fail, the failure and the error. Uh, we want to be able to compose conditions that it's waiting for so that we can reuse code. We have a long list of very specialized wait for pod to do X, Y, Z that are all different top level functions right now. They could be more modular. Um, and finally, sometimes the polling code detects that something has gone wrong permanently, so we want to abort polling. And if that list is too long, just to remember one thing, Gomega eventually and the counterpart consistently all do this right. Whenever you're in doubt, just use funct these functions here. You can also do that in integration tests, in a Go test, and it will almost certainly be more better, better than the code that you can write manually. But that is something that we need to tell people because some people are conservative. They are concerned about things that they don't understand. Like they need to learn about this Gomega eventually and how to invoke it. But it's, it's definitely better. Another framework specific thing is that sometimes in helper functions, we want to do a Gomega expect, but then when it fails, it's not the source code location of that helper function that is of interest, but where it was called. And we, we solved that by turning Gomega failures into errors that we pass up back the call chain. We can wrap these errors so that we get additional context. And then in the main test, we have an expect no error that dumps that error with all the information. That's where framework expect no error is, used, is coming in. Um, so that's how we handle helper functions because Gomega itself has some problems you can pass an offset, but it's a bit tricky. This is, this is our, our alternative solution here. And a good example, if you're looking for code that does that, is the test E2E framework pods helper, because I've, I've done a lot of updates to, to make that particular package use these best practices, and I've, I've used that as a test case that my, my changes actually make sense and, and lead to better code. And with that, yeah, I'm, I'm almost at, at the end of my talk, we do have time for questions afterwards, and I, I want to discuss a few things. So I've mentioned the blog post. The QR diagram here is taking you to this blog post. It, it is basically summarizing all of the things that I described, or expanding on the things that I'd summarized in this talk with, with a lot more information about the individual aspects, like the proper handling of contexts. That's all spelled out explicitly there. Um, it was also copied into the upstream documentation, which we do have, but that other documentation under Kubernetes um, for the Contributors uh, web page, that's a GitHub repo, that, that document is a bit longer. It doesn't not, it explains other things that haven't changed, and this blog post perhaps is a, is a good, better starting point. I do have some plans for this. I want to en enable linting both in Kubernetes itself. That's the first thing that I need to get, that, that I need to learn. I had another talk at uh, the Contributor Summit about linting of pull requests because we, had, we don't follow best practices in the existing code. If we enable additional checking in the linter configuration that it gets applied to all code, we certainly have, we will have failures because we haven't modified all of the existing code. My plan for Kubernetes is to enable linting stricter linting in pull requests for the code that gets added or modified. At that time, we can say, okay, you're doing something that we have done in the past, but don't do it anymore. Do something better instead, and we will get better code over time. The, cor the cor uh, configuration that I'm currently suggesting for Kubernetes doesn't do anything with testing, but there is a Gingo and Gomega linter it has been integrated into Golang CI lint, and it checks for a lot of things that are useful 
So once I know that I can do this, I, I, I'll probably propose a change of configuration that also makes tests uh, or writing tests easier because it will check for things automatically. Then something that potential contributors could pick up is converting more of the sub packages that we do have in the framework. Some of these are domain specific, but it could be easily farmed out now. Now that we know how to do it, we could continue and basically clean up all of the other helper functions too, which will be useful. It will benefit Kubernetes because at some point, someone will write a new test and will swear about this timed out waiting for condition because he is calling a helper function that doesn't use Gomega eventually yet. And it would be good for your karma if you help out Kubernetes here, making, paying back some of the technical debt that has, has accumulated here. And well, that, that karma is one thing, but I know of self-interest self is perhaps the biggest, best motivator to get some work done. If you are developing a component that needs end-to-end -end testing, then it, of course, would be nice if you are a Kubernetes contributor to use the same tools that you are familiar with in Kubernetes also outside of Kubernetes. And that's where this question comes in, can we move this code in this un into staging? So technically, we can. The dependency issue that has prevented that in the past has been solved. Should we do it? I'm not sure. At this point, some of the API is, well, we, we, we preserved all of the old APIs because we didn't want to rewrite all of the tests. So we still have a lo long variety of pods Expect, frame, expect pod to reach a certain state and all of these functions that are in the pods direct pods package probably shouldn't be in staging, but someone would need to look at all of these and decide which ones are useful, which ones should be something that kind of become a stable API. And a staging, we don't guarantee API stability, but it's not nice to, to change it because it will break some people. So, it would be more work to move it under staging. My hope would be that if we do it and someone is willing to help us with that, that we get more people help us maintain this software. And that benefits, into, that, that, that benefits Kubernetes, that benefits everyone, because right now the set of people maintaining it is fairly small. And we, we could certainly use more help. So if you want to get involved, SIG testing channel on Slack, is the place to, to reach out. I'm watching that fairly closely. I'll, I'll try to be as, as responsive as I can. Um, yeah, and with that, I think our time is up. So I've talked a lot. We have time, I hope, for questions. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I'm just curious about um, your thoughts on all of the different, I think you called them, I don't know if they're sub packages or what they are, um, but you know, I guess specifically I'm thinking of the, the ETE node tests versus the standard ETE tests. Yeah. Does it make sense to have those extra sub packages or would it be better if they were somehow all merged into just having a single ETE framework? Um, I think the sub packages are useful. One of the things that they do or that they could do is um, have their own configuration options, for example. That's, what, that's one aspect that's not currently particularly clean. We have an E2E framework test context that contains lots of options that are sometimes referenced by the sub-tests, sub-packages, but if you build and then if you build a test suite that doesn't use those sub-packages and doesn't use the tests that depend on these options, you still end up with a test suite that has a long list of command line parameters that, doesn't, that don't do anything. So more modularity, I think, would be a good thing. Well, better, better implemented modularity. I think the granularity that we have right now is okay. We just need to make it cleaner and we need to re move around a few things like the, the we need to move the configuration options out of the framework into the code that actually depends on them. That would be one of the things that a, that a contributor could do also in Kubernetes. 
we, and yeah, the, the stable ABI question is the other one. How much of that, of these helper packages are useful in general and are worth being in staging? Because they are sub packages, we can now make a decision case by case and gradually move things, uh, create internal aliases, uh, import the state, import the functions and the public symbols uh, to, to smooth the transition. Uh, so we could come up with a with a with an iterative approach. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for listening and enjoy the booth crawl. <laughs> <laughs>